Washingtonians deserve equality. We deserve fairness. And that's what full statehood means. The residents who live in the nation's capital are determined to be recognized and to be treated as full and equal citizens. The cry for justice has never been silenced. Grant us statehood, just as Congress has granted statehood to 37 states since the Founding Fathers. The struggle for equality never abandoned. The only way that we are going to treat the citizens of the District of Columbia as equals is to make them a state. This body changed the boundaries in the 1800s to ensure that slave owners could keep their slaves. We have changed the boundaries in the committee to allow for the federal city to still exist and the residents of D.C. to become a state. It's been done by this body before. Don't make it seem like it's something that can't happen again. These are important steps to getting uh, the ability to take care of ourselves and to make sure that the taxes that we pay get what we deserve as our birthright as Americans. And that's full representation in this Congress. On June 26, 2020, a historic victory. Momentum towards justice, parity, fairness for the residents of the District of Columbia, the House of Representatives passed the Washington, D.C. Admission Act, clearing a major legislative hurdle for statehood. There being 232 votes in the affirmative, 180 votes in the negative, the District of Columbia Statehood Bill, H.R. 51, is passed without objection. It was Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton who, as she has done many times during her decades in Congress, introduced H.R. 51, calling for statehood for D.C. My service in the Congress has been dedicated to achieving equality for the people I represent, which only statehood can provide. Companion legislation has been introduced in the Senate. Delaware Senator Tom Carper introduced the Washington, D.C. Admissions Act with a record 38 co-sponsors. And as long as the road has been to get to this point, there's much road ahead, paved with lingering concerns. This is more than just a local issue for the District of Columbia. It is a civil rights issue. Make no mistake, race underlies every argument against D.C. statehood and denying its citizen equal participation and representation is a racial, democratic, and economic injustice we cannot tolerate. The drive for self-determination for the District of Columbia is a legacy that has endured for more than 200 years. In a way, it's become a dreaded inheritance for Washingtonians, an effort handed down from one generation to the next for many, many generations. My great-grandfather, Richard Holmes, walked away as a slave from a plantation in Virginia. I continue on the walk that my family has made since then to freedom in this city until all of us who live here today in the District of Columbia can go the full distance to achieving the prize of equal citizenship with the D.C. statehood. But there have been gains. In 1963, a constitutional amendment made it possible for district residents to vote in presidential elections. Four years later, the city elected its first school board. Just three years after that, D.C.'s first delegate to the Congress of the United States was voted into office. And finally, the District of Columbia Home Rule Act of 1973 cleared the way for city residents to elect their own government, which they did in the fall of 1974. And in 1975, D.C.'s first elected mayor and city council were sworn in, giving residents a small bit of self-government at last. But there was a catch. Congress would continue to control the city's budget and would have final say in what could and could not be made into law in the nation's capital. And that catch has far-reaching effects. 
it not only denies the council and the mayor the ability to completely do their work, it continues to force DC residents to live with a glaring constitutional anomaly. They pay federal income taxes, but have no vote in the Congress, no say so on issues that affect them and how they live. We see with the inception of the country that when the Federalist Papers were written, Madison made it very clear there was no intention that the, this federal city would remain under the uh, jurisdiction of Congress indefinitely, that, that this community would have full enfranchisement because that was the whole spirit and purpose of America. Statehood has been rooted in D.C. politics since the very first elected council. Julius Hobson Sr. co-founded the Statehood Party in 1969 and successfully ran for a council seat on the statehood platform in 1974. The party represented the belief and ideals of statehood for D.C. It also offered that the lack of statehood was a civil rights issue for D.C.'s majority black population. Councilwoman Hilda Mason embodied this message. She served as the statehood party representative on the council from 1977 to 1999. One reason why uh, Dear Youth Hobson Sr. and I and some other people organized the statehood movement and, and a statehood party, and that's why we want statehood, because we feel that we have the same rights and privileges, or we're entitled to the same rights and privileges that other residents of the United States have. So when they interfere with us, it is really saying that we don't have the same rights that other people in this country have. And I do not agree with that since I pay national taxes. The call for full voting rights soon became a demand for statehood. In 1978, Congress passed a constitutional amendment to give D.C. full congressional voting rights. The amendment was never ratified. Two years later, D.C. voters approved a measure for a statehood constitutional convention initiative to create a constitutional pathway to statehood. For the next three years, all milestones for passage were met. Delegates were elected, a constitution was written and ratified, and challenges from the Hill were addressed. Then, on September 9, 1983, Mayor Marion Barry presented the statehood petition to the Congress, where no action was taken. Statehood activists remained undaunted. In 1983, D.C.'s first elected delegate to Congress, Walter Fauntroy, got the statehood ball rolling on Capitol Hill and introduced H.R. 3861, the New Columbia Admission Act. The next year, he introduced H.R. 325, while Senator Ted Kennedy addressed the issues on the Senate side with Senate Bill 2672. In 1985, 1987, 1989, and 1990, Fauntroy and Kennedy did some sort of tag team legislation on behalf of D.C. statehood to no avail. Congress simply ignored their bills. During this time, Senator Kennedy said D.C. was being denied statehood because of the four twos. Too liberal, too urban, too black, and too democratic. And one must wonder if the words of a Southern senator in the late 1870s set the tone for the D.C. statehood fight into the 21st century. After the 15th Amendment gave black men in D.C. the vote, many in Congress opined that the move was a mistake. Alabama Senator John Tyler Morgan was more direct. He said it was necessary to deny voting rights and representation to district residents in order to burn down the barn to get rid of the rats. The rats, he said, being the Negro population, and the barn being the capital city itself. While well, the 1990 congressional victory of D.C. delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton brought new energy to the struggle, nothing much changed. She introduced statehood bills, and Congress took no action on them. This would be the outcome in 1991, 1992, 1993, and 1995. But things were a little bit different in 1993. Your vote was but a symbol of respect for the only Americans to whom the slogan no taxation without representation still applies. 
Under the terms that H.R. 51 has come to the floor, your vote will be a vote for the principle of self-government and representative democracy. Please join the many who have already committed. Please vote aye on H.R. 51. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Norton was at least able to see H.R. 51 put to a vote by the full House before it died. The A's are 153, the nays are 277, and the bill is not passed. In 1995, Congress delivered a crushing blow to D.C. Citing poor fiscal management, Congress stripped the mayor and the council of nearly all power, replaced the elected school board with an appointed school board, and installed financial control managers to oversee the day-to-day -day financial operations of each city agency. These devastating actions would remain in place for six long years, further fueling calls for statehood. Our system of government in the United States of America, it was that the individual would have a level of sovereignty, as would the jurisdiction in which residents or citizens lived would have a sovereignty, and that no one should have to be under the thumb of a overreaching federal interest. Even after the control board was nullified, the insults of D.C.'s non-statehood status continued to mount. D.C. voted for medical marijuana. Congress squashed it. D.C. wanted to fund needle exchange programs, special education, voting petition drives, reproductive rights, and salary increases for its council. Denied, denied, denied. All denied by Congress, which has final say over D.C.'s budget. There was no Senate action for two decades. Then in 2014, a hearing, a hearing that went nowhere, leaving D.C.'s ambitions for self-government in a federal legislative limbo. And in that challenging environment, the statehood movement continued to grow. D.C. Mayors Marion Barry, Sharon Pratt Kelly, Anthony Williams, Adrian Fenty, Vincent Gray, and Muriel Bowser have all advocated for statehood. It would be great to have budget autonomy, to be able to control the decision-making around our own uh, dollars. Uh, same thing with our local laws. Certainly to have uh, a vote uh, for our congresswoman would be important, but to me, the ultimate goal is statehood, and that's what we need to continue to strive to achieve. Over the last 75 years or so, almost every U.S. president has had a favorable view of home rule or limited home rule for the district, but most of them equivocated when it came to the issue of statehood. But Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Joe Biden all voiced their support for D.C. statehood. What can the American people see first from the Clinton administration and also for the issue of D.C. statehood? I know you put the issue in the, the hands of Congress. Just where would that priority be now that you meet well, met I think some it, of the congressional leaders? I didn't put it in the hands of Congress. That's what the Constitution does. Congress would have to act, but I believe in it and I, I support it. And I assume a bill will be introduced and I, I expect to support it. Folks in D.C. pay taxes like everybody else. They contribute uh, to the the overall well-being of the country like everybody else, uh, they should be represented like everybody else. Do you support D.C. becoming the 51st state with 51 votes in the Senate? Absolutely, after the last 28 years. With 51 votes in the Senate? Yes. Mayor Muriel Bowser, now in her second term, has taken the conversation to the next level. Under her guidance, the call for statehood has a loud and steady drumbeat echoing from coast to coast and around the globe. This is a constitutional crisis. It should be viewed as a constitutional crisis. And whenever you have hundreds of thousands of people who are disenfranchised in any particular way, that should be a concern, I would argue, for all Americans. If you oppose D.C. statehood, you support taxation without representation. Grant D.C. statehood. I have hundreds of thousands of Americans not represented in the Congress or the Senate with an actual vote is a travesty, especially in our nation's capital. That's not equality. It should be rectified as soon as possible. I'm a U.S. Marine Corps veteran from Mesa, Arizona. Today I'm standing with D.C. veterans and calling for D.C. statehood. D.C. statehood is a racial justice issue. 700,000 American citizens do not have representation in our government. 
I stand with fellow DC veterans in calling for DC statehood. We should have representation in Congress no matter where you live. The phrase taxation without representation lacks an active call to action. To redress that issue, this bill would amend Title IV of the District of Columbia Revenue Act of 1937 to require the standard motor vehicle tag to display the phrase end taxation without representation. We raise our taxes locally and we pay it our own way. Not only that, we pay more federal taxes than 22 states and more per capita than all 50. And we receive less back. Hear me well. We receive less back than 23 states. You know what that makes us? A donor state. A donor not yet state. In 2016, Mayor Bowser called for a referendum vote on D.C. statehood. Residents showed their support for full self-government and again, boundaries separating the federal city from the people's city were drawn, a constitution was drafted, and a name, this time a name more reflective of the city's vibe was chosen, the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth, to honor the actions of abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Peeling back the layers of opposition to statehood reveals more damning motives, issues of racism and partisanship, and a helplessness that the January 2021 mob attack on city streets and the U.S. Capitol made tragically clear. Without statehood, city officials can only do so much to fully protect their citizens. The decisions made in this Congress affect the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans who live all across our nation, obviously, but of course, right here in D.C. The ability for us to access health care, to protect ourselves from gun violence, to create and execute the laws and policies that align with the values, our values. We know our values better than any member of this Congress, excluding our Congresswoman. Our fight for statehood, our fight for equality is not just political in nature, but the inequality that we face as second-class citizens in our own country can in fact have life or death consequences. DC statehood promises the full restoration of civil liberties for DC residents by ensuring our vote in Congress. Let's fight back against the cries that we're too liberal or we're too black or there are too many Democrats. Who we elect is our business, and the business of America is to make sure that each person uh, is represented fully in this House and in the Senate of the United States of America. Statehood is not yet at hand. There are battles yet to be won. But the call for D.C. statehood has many voices in many quarters that are willing to be heard. Make this the 51st state and let's get a vote and let us get all Americans represented. We will write this grave injustice, which is an affront to our democracy. Passes of H.R. 51, I love the name, Washington, D.C. Admissions Act, will be heroic, historic and heroic, yes, and will take this strong step toward admitting the state of Washington. Douglas Commonwealth into the union. Mr. Speaker, today I rise in support of DC statehood. I rise in support of what is fair, what makes sense, and what is right. It is not right that there's still American for whom democracy is not a living reality. It is not right that there's still Americans who face taxation with our representation. I urge you to support statehood for the District of Columbia. While it is my great pleasure to be the mayor of my hometown, born here without a vote, but I swear I will not die here without a vote because we know that everyone all across the United States now knows and recognizes the plight of Washington, D.C a plight that statehood advocates and activists are working to resolve on the road to representation.